Welcome to the eighth webinar in our COVID-19 webinar series titled COVID-19 and Respiratory Tools, How to Access, Use, and Clean Inhalers, Nebulizers, and More. My name is Tanya Winders, and I am the President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network. This webinar is first being aired on July 9th, 2020, and all of the information shared today is in line with current recommendations by the various government entities. The coronavirus outbreak remains a fluid situation and guidance may certainly change in the future. This webinar supports the mission of Allergy and Asthma Network, which is to end needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. And we are excited and certainly appreciative of your time and participation today. We have over 3,500 people that have registered and are attending the webinar this afternoon. So at this point, I'd like to also uh, welcome Dr. Purvi Parikh, who is joining me today to present on this important topic. Dr. Parikh is an adult and pediatric allergist and immunologist at Allergy and Asthma Associates of Murray Hill. She is currently on faculty as clinical assistant professor in both departments of medicine and pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. She has been passionate about health policy and is on the board of directors of the Advocacy Council of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. And she also travels to Washington, D.C. multiple times per year to help shape policy, testify before the government, and advocate on behalf of her patients and the organizations that she volunteers and works for, including the United Nations Foundation, Shots at Life, and Allergy and Asthma Network. We look forward to, to sharing some important information today on respiratory tools and also look forward to taking your questions at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Dr. Preek. Thank you for having me. So in our time today, we do plan to provide you as we typically do with a COVID-19 update. And then we will also turn the focus to respiratory treatments in different settings first in the home, and then looking at school issues with respiratory tools, and then looking at respiratory care tools in the office and hospital settings. And then we'll conclude our time by looking at resources to help patients afford their medications as the pandemic continues and the unemployment rates continue to rise. So what is the current state of COVID-19 here as we sit on July 9th of 2020? We always turn to our friends at Johns Hopkins and their wonderful COVID-19 dashboard to help us see what the numbers are doing. And as you can see from this slide, we currently have over 12 million confirmed cases of COVID throughout the world, with the US now exceeding 3 million cases. Globally, we also have now surpassed the 550,000 death toll mark with over 130,000 deaths here in the U.S. And again, this is a, a very reliable source of the statistics and the data that you can drill down and look at the global level as well as individual regions or specifically the U.S. We also rely heavily on the Center for Disease Control, the CDC's data. And you can see here that as of today, the total confirmed cases in the US based on the CDC's data is quickly approaching 3 million. Also of note is the total new cases that was reported of over 50,000 new cases in the past 24 hours. Um, this is something that has consistently concerned us at the network, and I'm sure you as well, as we continue to see that total new case uh, number escalate each and every day. And then the total deaths exceeding the 130,000 mark, as we mentioned before. The nice thing about the CDC data is you can actually drill down to the state level, and you can also see where there are higher prevalence pockets um, within different regions of the country. So those epicenters that we've spoken about before of uh, Texas, Florida, uh, New York, certainly across the, the Northeast are evident through this map. So what are the headlines? What's in the news uh, over the last 10 days around COVID? Certainly we're seeing many states that are mandating face masks. Uh, if you're out in public, mandating that you actually wear face masks and penalizing uh, individuals for not wearing face masks. 
There's also a continued concern over the lack of social distancing at protest that uh, more than likely has certainly added to the new cases of coronavirus that have been noted. Dr. Fauci uh, continues, who leads the, the COVID-19 task force for the White House and the administration, um, continues to say that there's a more infectious strain of the coronavirus that may actually be emerging. Um, this new strain may make the virus actually more transmissible, but not all scientists are actually in agreement about this. And we certainly need continued research to better understand the coronavirus and how it may be um, morphing into other strains. We also have this quote from Dr. Fauci that explains that we're still knee deep in what he defines as the first wave of this pandemic. And he says that he would not be, it really wouldn't be considered a wave. It's more of a surge or a resurgence of infections that has been superimposed upon the baseline of already existing cases. And he warns us that a false narrative to take comfort in a lower rate of death uh, could lead to complacency, so don't allow yourself to fall into that false sense of complacency as we come into the summer months and, and certainly the peak of summer here in July. Also in the news, FDA has established a formal warning to consumers and healthcare providers around sharp increases in hand sanitizer products that could be labeled to contain ethanol, but actually may contain methanol. Methanol is not an acceptable active ingredient for hand sanitizers and actually has some toxic side effects. And so certainly that's a concern and something that the FDA has drawn our attention to in the last few days. Also of note, uh, as of yesterday, the Trump administration has begun to formally withdraw from the World Health Organization. Uh, there's been much political posturing over the last 24 hours with uh, Biden clearly saying that he would reverse that decision if uh, President Trump moves forward with it. And, and again, that does take about a year to even uh, initiate that formal withdrawal process, which would result in significant financial uh, constraints at the World Health Organization and the amount of over 500 million a year that the US has traditionally supported those efforts. And we also heard from the World Health Organization that they are going to be traveling to China this weekend and looking at the uh, source and the host of of where the outbreak actually began. So the WHO is taking strides to better understand the original source of coronavirus and, and, and really provide um, insights to the rest of the world based off of those findings. The COVID-19 antibody drug has moved into phase three trials and the vaccine trials are also continuing to advance. So that is some of the positive news that has been in the headlines over the last 10 days. And again, when you look at the new cases by day, we did hit the milestone of exceeding the 50,000 cases per day uh, in the US over the last week. And, and so this is of concern as we continue to see that rise in new cases day by day. Uh, the dip that we saw in late May, early June seems to uh, now be you know, a thing of the past. And there's question around, is that due to the wider availability of testing and more accurate diagnosing of COVID? Or is it in fact that we're just seeing a higher volume of cases? Again, as we just level set on kind of where we are in the COVID-19 pandemic, I want to remind you that we have our COVID-19 Information Center at allergyandasthmanetwork.org. And here is the link and all of the different resources that are available uh, for you there. Uh, we have tried to keep that information updated and certainly add new webinar recordings and infographics and, and Q&As as our time has progressed uh, now into the, the fourth month of the pandemic. So please know that we understand this is a constantly evolving situation. The guidance that even we provide today around the use of respiratory tools and the, the way that um, in the home setting, the school setting, in the hospital and outpatient setting, we should move forward. It's likely to change and perhaps change two or three times in the coming days, but we are going to try to provide that guidance as best as possible as we understand and know it today. 
So now I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Preek as she explores the respiratory treatments in the home. No, thank you. Um, that was an excellent overview. Um, just one comment that I had wanted to make was I know that there are a lot of thoughts that these you know, cases are increasing uh, simply due to increased testing, but you know, a lot of um, researchers have looked at this and we've you know, found that that's not in fact the case, that the actual percentage of cases have far outpaced the percentage of testing. So if the both were increasing at the same rate, we would say yes, this is because we're testing more, but it's not. There, it actually is new cases. So uh, I, I agree with what um, you know Tanya had said. We cannot let our, our guards down, you know. And the death rate, I agree with Dr. Fauci, can be dis, uh, misleading because we're seeing data that even if you come out of COVID, people are left with long-term health consequences, neurological, pulmonary, cardiac. It, it affects every organ system. So we have to be very, very careful when we, we're only looking at the death rate because the consequences are far greater than just, you know, uh, getting over a mild illness. But anyway, with that, I'll, I'll go on. Um, next slide. So respiratory tools, you know, are very important, especially for many of you that are um, attending today. So, you know, what are the most common respiratory tools that people with um, chronic lung conditions like asthma or COPD use? So inhalers by far are one of the most common the metered dose inhaler or, or uh, a dry powder inhaler, um, spacers, valve holding chambers, all of these are very, very important tools to make sure that uh, medication delivery gets to where it needs to go um, deep within your lungs. Uh, nebulizer as well, many asthmatics you know, rely heavily on nebulizers, especially when they're having a flare up of their symptoms. And then of course our diagnostic tools, right? Um, uh, not just physicians, but also patients rely on spirometry, pheno, peak flow meters to assess how their asthma control is and to make modifications um, to their treatment. Uh, next slide. So what is our best defense um, against this pandemic or in general? You know, asthma control uh, is the best defense. And, you know, numerous studies have shown that it doesn't matter if you're mild, moderate, or severe. The thing that predicts bad outcomes is control. So a very well-controlled severe asthmatic will do far better than an uncontrolled intermittent asthmatic or moderate asthmatic. And, and there's good reason behind that. Um, so based on available information to date, those at um, high risk for severe illness from COVID-19 include, um, you know, people with chronic lung disease, um, moderate to severe asthma, uh, people who are immune compromised, and those on oral corticosteroids, because of course your uh, immune systems are more suppressed than the average person. Um, and then people of any age with certain underlying medical medical conditions, particularly if not well controlled. And, and the top three of those that we saw were obesity, um, diabetes, and heart disease. And often those three coexist in um, many of our asthmatics as well and our allergy sufferers. So the COVID-19 issues, you know, COVID is spread through droplets in the air. Um, now some evolving evidence may even show that those droplets may linger in the air. Um, inhalers with spacers, you know, contain respiratory droplets, of course, uh, and nebulizers spread droplets through the air and even aerosolize them um, to make them go further and, uh, you know, become lighter. And then those lighter droplets tend to hang around longer, too, and could be potentially dangerous to spreading or transmitting the virus. Um, be sure to have access to asthma care. You know, telehealth has been a wonderful tool uh, for myself and my patients to kind of uh, keep in touch and make sure things are progressing as they should be without having to uh, create exposures on either side. Um, so all of these things are very, very important. Um, next slide. And asthma care, you know, make sure you're on the right dose and using the correct medications. Make sure your inhaler technique is correct too, because now if we are, you know, using less nebulizers, relying less on certain things such as um, 
valve uh, chambers or spacers, it's very important that we get our technique down correctly so that we're, you know, getting enough medication and getting it to where it needs to go. And know when to call if you're having trouble breathing. You know, know your warning signs and, and identify them early. Uh, review the importance, you know, of taking maintenance medications to control your asthma, you know, because prevention um, is, is key, especially when it comes to asthma as well as COVID-19. Um, and use your inhaler as directed. So make sure you know when to use your quick relief inhaler, how much is too much. And uh, of course, your controller medication. That not only should you have enough for this month, but we're actually advising people to have 90 day supplies during this pandemic so that you do not run out and don't have to make frequent trips to your pharmacy. Uh, next slide. So nebulizers at home. So if you, uh, people with known or suspected COVID-19 who are using ed, uh, nebulizers at home, these nebulizers should be used um, in a location that limits exposure to other household members, because again, it can spread and aerosolize those respiratory droplets um, and spread the virus. So the locations where the air is not circulated into the home are preferable. So outdoor areas, such as the porch, patio, garage, um, even if you can be near a window uh, and keep that window open, while, now that it's summer, uh, you know, we're able to keep doors and windows open so that way there's good ventilation and airflow. Next slide. And keeping that nebulizer clean is key. You know, follow the manufacturer's instructions for cleaning the nebulizer equipment. Um, some suggested guidelines include, you know, taking it apart, washing all parts of it, except the tubing and the finger valve in liquid dish soap and water and rinse with water. Um, the nice thing is that this virus is very um, amenable to just soap and water that does help uh, kill the virus. After washing the nebulizer, shake off any excess water and then reattach nebulizer uh, pieces and tubing to the air compressor and turn on the compressor to dry the nebulizer quickly. Uh, make sure the nebulizer is completely dry as well before storing it because as you know, um, the humidity and condensation may lead it to um, accumulating allergens such as dust mites or mold and that's the last thing you would need or other bacteria. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Tanya, who will go through school issues um, with the respiratory tools. Thank you, Dr. Preek, very helpful. And, and again, these are critically important tools for um, each of you who are living with chronic respiratory conditions. So as we look to asthma, COVID, and schools, um, we want to just ground by first reminding you that one out of 12 children are actually living with asthma. It is the leading cause of school absenteeism, and it does cause more than 10 million missed school days each and every year. And as symptoms of COVID-19 may overlap with asthma, Asthma, a lot of times it's difficult for students who are experiencing cough or shortness of breath um, to really know what's going on or the difference between asthma and COVID. And also for you, perhaps those of you on the line who are school nurses. Um, so what the, the recommendation and the guidance here, we developed a few resources to support um, your work and also to support patients and families who are making these decisions. But if students are experiencing a cough or shortness of breath, they really should not attend school unless that's approved by their healthcare provider in light of these days and times. And here is a, an algorithm that we've produced and uh, an infographic that you can download on our website, a free download that helps to uh, really walk through the steps when a student presents at the school health office, determining is it viral? If we know that perhaps it is, then moving down that path of assessing for additional viral symptoms like a fever, like a cough with or without wheeze, nasal congestion, headache, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, uh, poor appetite, uh, all of the, the other signs that may indicate that it's viral. Um, and then again, if the answer is yes to any of those things, assessing for asthma issues and treating as needed and following the asthma action plan that's in place, but then also isolating the student, calling the parent, and if confirmed COVID, assessing the risk, cons consulting the local health officials, and considering a two to five day building dismissal to clean, disinfect, 
and uh, address the contact trace issue. Uh, and that is the CDC guidance as of May 20th. We do understand that the CDC is going to provide some updated guidance in the next couple of weeks. And Allergy and Asthma Network will certainly be diligent in relaying that to you all as that guidance is released. So by August 1st, we anticipate seeing an update in the guidance from CDC for schools specifically. If it is not viral, then again, it's moving down that pathway of really the traditional assessment for asthma symptoms and addressing it in accord with the follow with the asthma action plan um, and, and moving through that algorithm as such. So please feel free again to download that and to have it as a quick reference for those of you who are in the school nurse setting. So what about inhalers at school? So we certainly know that there are different aspects to ensuring safety of inhalers at school. There are policies that when permitted by school policies or state law that students should be allowed to use their personal inhaler. Now in 50 states, we do have those laws on the books that allow students to carry their personal inhaler, emergency medication on their person. Um, if the, the student, their parent, and their healthcare provider believe that they are mature enough to do so. Um, also, in cleaning those inhalers, all surfaces of the inhaler should be clean using a wipe with at least 70% alcohol after each use and then allowing that inhaler to air dry. And then on the administration of inhalers, um, self-administering inhalers really should practice good hand hygiene and wash their hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before and after administration is the recommendation. If soap and water isn't available, then again, using that alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol content is the recommendation. So using these steps and ensuring that you've got the policies in place and the cleaning and the administration of um, staff administered inhalers is, is vitally important in full setting. So how do we clean spacers or valved holding chambers? These are some of the detailed washing instructions um, uh, around cleaning spacers and valve holding chambers, but it does vary from brand to brand. And so we encourage you to look at that individual brand. Um, many of these valve holding changer, chambers and spacers are actually dishwasher safe on the top rack. And so many will actually encourage you to do that at this point. But you should disassemble following the instructions on the holding chamber. And then uh, again, of course, always removing that MDI from the holding chamber before washing so that you don't get the uh, water in the MDI. And, and then uh, again, remembering that the MDIs require a totally different cleaning procedure without water, usually that alcohol wipe as we spoke about. But soaking the parts of the valve holding chamber or the spacer in a large bowl in lukewarm water with liquid dish dishwashing detergent and allowing those pieces to sit for at least 15 minutes. And remembering that choosing a bowl large enough for the chamber to rest fully in the water is important here. After the 15 minute time frame, then rinsing all the pieces in clean water and air drying, uh, shaking off the excessive water, allowing a, a clean place for them to air dry, lint free cloth, an air dry rack, um, and resting the chamber on its end vertically rather than horizontally is the typical recommendation from the manufacturers. But then afterward, um, you know, certainly not using a towel dry because that can build up the static charge in the, the valve holding chamber, but reassembling and making sure that all the pieces are completely dry and putting them back according to the instructions. So what about in those states where you have implemented stock albuterol inhalers? If a stock inhaler is used, then it must be cleaned according to the manufacturer's instructions after each use. We also recommend that you use the disposable mouthpieces or spacers with that inhaler if possible. And we do have um, specific uh, ways that we can help you to access those disposable mouthpieces and spacers from Allergy and Asthma Network if you are in need of them but also employing those additional strategies to reduce risks that include using spacers with one-way valves and not allowing the student to actually touch the inhaler. Um, they can hold the inhaler to, with the spacer without actually touching the, the inhaler that will be used time and time again. 
And then when it comes to nebulizers and peak flow meters in the school setting, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we certainly have been advocating that asthma treatments are using, using inhalers with spacers are preferred over nebulizers. We know that nebulizers really should be reserved only for those students who cannot use an inhaler or who simply don't have access to an inhaler. And peak flow meter, meters, um, of course, involve the forceful exhalation, um, which is not considered to aerosolize or generate that aerosolizing generating procedure, although the data is very limited. So it oftentimes can produce a cough in students with asthma, and you should be careful and just be aware and monitoring those students who may use peak flow meters, although that has uh, the use of those has declined significantly in recent years. Both of these two uh, re respiratory tools or devices actually do pose some risk in spreading COVID-19 in the school setting. So it, it's important to be diligent and certainly to be on guard um, when students are using either of these two. In cleaning nebulizers at school, we do have some recommendations as well. After every use, it's important to rinse the nebulizer cup, mask, or mouthpiece thoroughly in warm water, and then shake off the excessive water and allow it to air dry. At the end of each day, the nebulizer cup, mask, or mouthpiece should be washed with warm soapy water and rinsed with clean water and then laid out on a paper towel to dry overnight. And then the recommendation is that once a week, you would do the additional cleaning procedure of washing with warm soapy water, disinfecting with white vinegar. And you can see here that we offer the white vinegar solution that's recommended to soak the equipment for 20 minutes, rinse well under a, a steady stream of water, shake off the excess water and allow to, to actually towel dry. And then you can store all those um, pieces of the nebulizer in a plastic zippered bag. Um, the nebulizer kit, cup, mask, or mouthpiece really should not be used for multiple children. That is a prime way to uh, spread the viral infections. In regard to nebulizer administration and for the staff that will actually be administering NEBS to students, they should be wearing PPE, the proper gloves, um, face mask, and gloves are, are very important and actually administering nebulizer treatments, and they should receive training on how to safely administer treatments and appropriately use and dispose of the PPE afterward. So as you're thinking about your back to school time and certainly those in services on training staff around nebulizer use, it's important to ensure that you've updated your policies and procedures to include the wearing of PPE and the disposal of PPE. During the actual administration of the NEBS, only the student and the staff responsible for administration should be in the room. And if appropriate, that staff member may actually may leave the room. Um, and after administration, the room really should undergo a routine cleaning and disinfecting. And we know that this has sparked a lot of questions that many school nurses um, have very limited space um, in, in which they are operating. And so again, this is a key point and how we might you know, look forward to the administration of nebulizers um, during the, the pandemic as schools prepare to reopen. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Parikh and she is going to update us on respiratory care tools in the office and hospital setting. Dr. Parikh? Okay, thank you very much. So um, meter dose inhalers, you know, many hospitals may reuse uh, MDIs, but an MDI should be dedicated to a single patient during their hospitalization or until uh, the medication is discontinued, especially in um, times like these when we're trying to curb the spread of infection. Um, hospitals should also implement a workflow regarding MDI use. Um, and then if MDIs must be reused due to the shortage, a strict st uh, sterilization protocol should be followed as well. Next slide. Uh, aerosol generating procedures. Um, per the CDC, the concern is for procedures that may generate higher concentrations of infectious respiratory aerosols. These are uh, aerosol generating procedures known to create um, uncontrolled respiratory secretions. So this includes open suctioning of airways, sputum induction, um, CPR, and endotracheal intubation and extubation. 
Um, and even non-invasive ventilation, such as BiPAP and CPAP, can generate these aerosols. Bronchoscopy, uh, manual ventilation, and of course, uh, nebulizers and, and spirometries are also considered aerosol-generating aerosol procedures. Next slide. Uh, if they're performed, the following needs to occur. Um, the healthcare provider should be wearing proper PPE, and that includes an N95 or equivalent or higher level respirator, eye protection, gloves, and a gown. The number of healthcare providers uh, present during the procedure should be limited to only those essential for the patient care and procedure support, and visitors uh, obviously should not be present for the procedure. Also, uh, it should ideally take place in an airborne infection isolation room or a room where there has uh, good airflow and ventilation. Next slide. Um, and then environmental infection control is equally important. So dedicated medical equipment should be used when caring for patients with suspected or confirmed uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, so to you know avoid cross-contamination. All non-dedicated, non-disposable medical equipment used for patient care should be cleaned and disinfected according to manufacturer's instructions and facility policies. Routine cleaning and disinfection procedures are appropriate for SARS-CoV-2 in the healthcare setting, including um, those patient care areas in which aerosol-generated procedures are performed. Using cleaners and water to pre-clean surfaces first, um, you should apply an EPA-registered hospital-grade disinfectant to frequently touch surfaces or objects for appropriate contact times as indicated on the product's label. Next slide. So nebulizers, here, you know, it's kind of a gray area because guidance is un uh, unsure. So, you know, we just talked about nebulizer guidance at school, um, but it's uncertain whether the aerosols from some procedures, including the nebulizer administration um, and high flow oxygen delivery will result in generating infectious and respiratory aerosols. Um, during the SARS outbreak, uh, nebulizers actually were not associated with significantly increased transmission risk of the virus. Um, and in a 2004 study of SARS, uh, was unable to detect the presence of airborne SARS when a patient used a nebulizer or humidifier. So in the UK, guidance on COVID-19 um, transmission does not list nebulizers as a potential infection risk as the aerosols come from the medication, not the patient itself. So there may be, you know, um, some good news there. I know many of us uh, had limited use of nebulizers early on in the pandemic, and even now, uh, just as a preventative and extra cautious measure. But as we get more data from COVID-19, I think this guidance hopefully will become more solidified. Next slide. <laughs> So spirometry and pheno, this is the other gray area. Um, so they are identified at aer as aerosol-generated procedures. Um, so we use them now only when essential for immediate treatment decisions, uh, when we need it to guide management. Recommended that care providers use appropriate PPE, again, to limit uh, droplets on staff and individuals. Again, enhanced cleaning is recommended, wiping down surfaces with the appropriate cleaners, and transmission may even occur from asymptomatic individuals. So that's one of the biggest concerns. Um, increased Increasing levels of pheno, or exhaled nitric oxide, may actually be an early indicator um, of the presence of coronavirus. So in some cases, that even though um, you know, these diagnostic tools we use with hesitation, they may actually guide us in diagnosis. Next slide. So public health guidance. Um, you know, if the patient can tolerate a meter dose inhaler, then they should be switched to one with their own dedicated spacer. So I know it's common sometimes in families uh, to share spacers, you know, siblings or family members have asthma or share nebulizers um, due to cost, but especially given current state, that should be avoided as much as possible. If nebulizer is needed, all healthcare workers should wear appropriate um, PPE, including face mask, eye protection, gloves, and a gown. Keep the door closed during a nebulizer treatment so that um, those droplets can't travel to the other areas of the office. And once nebulizer is set up, healthcare workers should remain six feet away or more, or even outside of the door while the test is being performed. 
Next slide. And then with that, I'll hand it back over to Tanya to go through some resources um, to help patients afford their medications, especially with the current economic climate. Yes, so we certainly have heard from many patients who are concerned about accessing their medications. And we know that asthma inhalers and other types of respiratory medications can certainly vary in price. And some of them are very costly. Uh, some are less costly. And so if you can't currently afford your asthma inhaler or respiratory medication, there are some things that we would advise you to do. First of all, it's important to shop around. Um, you would be surprised at comparing prices at pharmacies or actually looking on apps like GoodRx or Select um, and, and finding out what your out-of-pocket expenses, even if you don't use your health insurance. In some cases, um, that the out-of-pocket expense is less through going through these um, uh, cost-saving apps. Um, and certainly by comparing those prices, you can get the best price at a variety of different pharmacies. And then it's also important to recognize that you can contact the manufacturer for patient assistance programs. If you're out of work, if your income has significantly shifted or changed, there are formal patient assistance programs that are in place to ensure that you can continue your routine care. And then also you can always speak to your doctor about potentially prescribing an alternative or looking for a less co uh, costly alternative if that's needed or actually obtaining a sample if they could uh, provide those as well. So there are many different ways that you can go about addressing the concern over medication costs, your out-of-pocket expense. And we know that this is of grave concern as the unemployment rates have risen and as more Americans are without health insurance in, in the midst of the pandemic. So at the allergyasthmanetwork.org website, if you click on the asthma tab and there is a next tab that says, what if I can't afford my asthma medications? And you'll see at that link that there's an actual list below to contact your manufacturer and understand more about their patient assistance program. If you're still unable to afford that medication, we really do advise you not to go without it. Um, it's important to have that conversation and be honest with your physician about the limitations and, and the access to the care that you so desperately need. And you can see here that this is some of the examples on that, um, that place at our website, where it includes um, all different types of respiratory medications, including your SABAs, your LABAs, your inhaled corticosteroids, your combination controllers, as well as your uh, long-acting muscarinic antagonists and your severe asthma treatments and your PDE4 inhibitors. So there's definitely um, a whole host and each one of them has a link that you can directly connect to the patient assistance program if needed. So at this time, we're going to, uh, we, we definitely have time to take your questions, and I have a few that have already come through. Um, so the first question, actually, I'm going to field to uh, Dr. Parikh, and it comes from um, Molly who uh, is a school nurse, and she says, um, I have a student that has an acapella flutter airway clearance device, which then has uh, re um, results in a productive cough for 15 to 20 minutes. Are there additional extra precautions that I should take when uh, working with this particular airway flutter airway clearance device for this patient? Right. So, I mean, the, the main thing is to make sure that that uh, airway device and that valve is uh, only used for that patient um, and it's not shared between patients. Um, and then I would enhance the, you know, cleaning protocols. So clean it based on how the manufacturer is recommending, but I would even go so far as to clean it very frequently, even um, uh, between uses or even on a daily basis. Um, but outside of that, you know, I think the best thing to do would be to contact the manufacturer and see if they have any additional recommendations um, for that specific device. Great recommendation there. And the next question has come up several times from several of the school nurses. Um, would, would you actually recommend wearing an N95 mask when performing respiratory care procedures for school nurses? 
Right. So, you know, we're, we're hoping that these respiratory care procedures are limited. As we mentioned earlier on uh, in the talk, you know, any child who is sick or coughing or wheezing really shouldn't be in school at all, you know, because uh, one, they're risking infecting their classmates and teachers and, and other people in the building. But um, if, you know, if a nurse has to perform a respiratory care procedure, I would absolutely recommend um, N95 masks and even uh, face shields you know, gloves, gowns if possible, um, especially for things such as um, nebulizers, uh, again, peak flows should be limited or a child should be using their own peak flow. Um, but yeah, I would err on the side of limiting these pr procedures in general because um, that child really shouldn't be in school or a daycare setting. Um, a really great question uh, comes from Kristen, who asked about the recommendation around CPAP machines, specifically in college dormitories. Um, we didn't mention CPAPs today, but again, another uh, important sleep apnea tool. Um, and, and what is the risk there associated with respiratory droplets and, and recommendation on the use of CPAPs in dorms? Right, so that actually is an excellent question, um, and and it does definitely complicate things because both BiPAPs and CPAPs are uh, on the list of aerosol gener generating uh, procedures or machines, and then a dorm setting is even more complicated. So I mean, the CPAP probably would not be a risk to everybody in the dormitory building, but it would be to those that are in that same room, sleeping in that same dorm room, so their roommate, it could be a potential risk to. So that's something that we need to consider as you know, college students, um, boarding school students start going back to school is that if they do use a nebulizer or CPAP, um, they may either need to find um, arrangements to have their own room, the school may need to make arrangements for that, or uh, you know, they might have to use those machines in, uh, in places where they're not exposing others. Now with a CPAP, it's much more complicated than a nebulizer because you can't just you know go and sleep outdoors or away from people. So that I think the rooming situation would have to change. Okay. So we've had several people ask about the asthma care at school infographic. You can actually go to our homepage at allergyasthmanetwork.org and there's a red button there for the COVID-19 information center. If you click on that button and then scroll to the bottom of the page, you'll see all of our infographics uh, distinguishing asthma versus COVID uh, as well as the asthma care at school infographic that was shared in today's webinar. Next question, Dr. Parikh, actually comes from Suzanne, and she says, should a nebulizer treatment be done in a nurse's office with no windows in a health suite? Right, so, you know, uh, ideally, no. <laughs> um, I mean, we again, we don't have good evidence that these nebulizer treatments are dangerous uh, because of what we had mentioned from our experience with the other uh, SARS viruses. Um, ideally, it should be done near a window or at least in a room where there is good ventilation. I know a lot of offices are now um, putting in, um, you know, ventilation systems that will allow for better airflow and filtration. So if, you know, if those measures are in place, then, then it should be okay. Again, I would have that nurse dress in the appropriate PPE as well. Um, you know, the door, of course, should be closed, but then if there is the question of airflow. Um, so, you know, I think until we have more guidance, um, we may want to find a different location for that nebulizer treatment. Okay. Um, a good question from Marie says, uh, is it appropriate and okay to store students albuterol inhalers in Ziploc bags if they are being held in the school nurse office? Uh, Ziploc bags are okay, um, but even better, I would say, would be brown paper bags. Um, we know that now, you know, the virus lives on various surfaces for varying amount of times. Luckily, most surfaces it's not more than 72 hours, but uh, paper bags tend to have less um, viability of the virus compared with plastics and other materials. But, uh, you know, a Ziploc bag isn't necessarily terrible. It's just that uh, paper bags, at least that's what they recommend to healthcare workers when we store our masks for reuse. That's very helpful. That's, that's really good to know. Um, and what about with 
individuals using their inhalers around other people. Is, is there risk associated with that? I mean, we know that you're typically inhaling, not exhaling or, or you know, sharing droplets. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you recommend social distancing in the very least? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's no, I think it, taking that extra precaution, because even if you're only inhaling, uh, I'm sure some droplets may be released, you know, as, as people, people use their inhaler, not everybody uses the inhaler correctly, because it's just a difficult device to use in general. So I would definitely stay, stand at least 10 feet away from other people when you're using your inhaler. Um, it, it's a considerate thing to do. Yeah, that's really great advice. And and the note around inhaler technique, of course, we know that greater than 70% of patients don't use their inhalers correctly right. um, when objectively assessed. We do have a number of resources around correct inhaler technique and use, and we actually have very uh, helpful videos from the National Jewish Respiratory Health Center um, on this on our website. So if you're looking for inhaler technique videos, please drop us an email um, or go to our website and, and search for those uh, inhaler technique videos. They're very helpful indeed. Okay, let's see. We've addressed that one. Just going to some of these. Um, a, a question around, have we developed a teaching tool for parents at this point? Um, we are working on some additional tools that you as school nurses will be able to share with your parents and families as school um, reopens. So those will be forthcoming. Let's see. How often do you believe that spacers should be cleaned is the question coming from Leslie, Dr. Preek. So I, I would basically use it as a rule of thumb to increase cleaning on, on everything. Uh, you know, as, as we all are, we're all cleaning our homes more, all surfaces more. Um, so I think spacers definitely should be cleaned at least once a week, but given the current times, maybe even more frequently every 48 to 72 hours, you know, because um, we do know that, you know, this virus can be in droplets, which our, our spacers are covered in. We know the virus can live on surfaces. So it's always a good idea. And, and then the same token, how we always say, don't touch your face because our hands are dirty and covered with germs. You know, every time we touch our spacers, that's another um, potential, you know, so it's another good reminder um, to also wash your hands frequently when you're using your inhaler, right? Because you're putting your uh, hands near your mouth and nose where you could presumably be transmitting virus. So, you know, keep washing your hands even before using your medications as well. Yeah, very important. And, you know, I, I just want to reinforce, we've said it several times, but uh, throughout all of our webinars, but definitely I want to reinforce today that ideally we would like for people not to use nebul nebulizers in school during COVID-19. I mean, we, right. we believe that that absolutely should be a last resort. And if a family is adamant or that's the only way that uh, a treatment could be administered, then perhaps it's best to actually send them home to administer that nebulizer treatment rather than doing it in the school setting. And, you know, so I, I know that we've reinforced that several times throughout today's webinar and others, but just want to re really drive that home because there are a number of questions around that here. Right. I, I completely agree. Uh, I think the first line should be to try that child's own MDI first. Uh, and then, as Tanya said, as an absolute last resort. Yeah. So here's an interesting question. Um, what, have you heard about the use of viral or bacterial filters that can be placed on the exhalation side of the nebulizer? That question comes from Diane. Oh, uh, that's very interesting. I actually, um, one, I didn't even know that those filters uh, existed for nebulizers, but, you know, I, I would be very curious to see the research or data behind it, but I, I personally was not aware of it. Yeah, um, neither was I, but I, I will definitely research it after this, Diane. Very interesting for sure. We'll let you know on our next webinar an update on that. Let's see. So a question around the use of pulse ox. We didn't mention that today as a respiratory mm -hmm. tool, but share with um, the audience a little bit about how pulse ox is being used specifically in light of COVID. 
Right. So pulse ox is actually very important in light of COVID because we know that this virus does attack the lungs. And what we've seen actually is a lot of um, what we call silent hypoxia. So people may not even realize, um, you know, that they're having breathing difficulties. And then when we take their pulse ox is actually quite low. So we've actually been recommending um, not just those of those that have chronic lung disease, but even others to keep, uh, you know, consider keeping a portable pulse ox at home. Uh, because it's good to monitor those levels, especially when your asthma is acting up. Um, but then in terms of shared pulse oxes, you know, they should be cleaned, wiped down between uh, each patient or each child, uh, let's say, if you use it at school. Um, but yeah, pulse ox is an extremely important tool in COVID-19 because often uh, these people become hypoxic without even realizing it. So that, that's actually an excellent question. And, and I would argue, and I've, I've told all my asthmatics that they should have one at home along with their peak flow meter during this pandemic. Yeah. Next question, again, a respiratory tool at school that we didn't necessarily spend a lot of time on today is on trachs and the suctioning of trachs. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a specific kind of apparatus that schools really should be using and what uh, specific procedures would you recommend for those that are uh, doing suctioning of traits? Right. So the suctioning of traits is for sure an aerosol generating procedure. So those who are doing those uh, procedures really need to protect themselves. That's the first and foremost, most important thing, uh, because if you get sick, then you're unable to take care of others. And that includes those N95 masks. Um, shields, um, gloves, uh, gowns. Um, I don't know of any specific devices um, that have been created to make it safer, but you know, during this time, there has been a lot of innovation uh, on that front. So, you know, I, I would definitely look into it because anything that reduces the risk to, the, to you or to the patient um, would be great. I know that there's been a lot of um, like these clear glass boxes where basically they've used these in hospitals to intubate patients um, where you know the person who's doing the intubation only their hands go into the glass box and that way everything kind of stays isolated in this uh, enclosed unit so something like that may exist actually for suctioning patients i just am not uh, aware of it but the most important thing i would say is the person performing the procedure needs those adequate protections in place and again, Absolutely. it should be done away away from other um, other students and people. Of course, yes, yeah, and taking those um, measures with the N95 mask and, and appropriate PPE for sure. Um, so this next question is one around um, students who are self-administering, and should they be escorted to the school nurse's office, or is it still appropriate for them to self-administer in the classroom, or have the nurse go to them? Right. Our so, typical, you know, with self-administration, we always, uh, yeah. even just, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I was just going to say oh, sorry, our go typical um, advice would be that if a student can self-administer, that they should and just uh, adhere to the appropriate social distancing directions that um, we had outlined. Um, but I, I don't know that, the, um, that the, the CDC will have to wait and see if they provide guidance around self-administration changes or having someone report to the school nurse's office for that. Um, any, any thoughts that you have, Dr. Freak? Right, no, I was gonna say the exact same thing. Yeah, if they're able to, they should, but of course, in a safe way to themselves and others. Okay. Um, let's see, any guidelines for asthma patients who are requesting letters that should be written excusing them from returning to work um, or even AP recommendations for students returning to in-school instruction? Um, is there any guidance that you've heard at this point as a provider? Right. So that, you know, is case by case basis, you know, because no two individuals have the same risk profile. And that's what I'm doing with my own patients. So uh, there isn't a clear answer. But yes, yeah, some I, I, you know, I, I have been writing those letters because they're either as an too uncontrolled or it's not safe for them to go back. So Unfortunately, there's no clear guidance, but I think it's left up to the, um, the physician and the patient to make that decision together. 
Yes. And of course, there is guidance as an employer around the time that one could be um, if diagnosed with COVID or uh, again with those high risk categories, there is guidance for employers. And, um, you know, that, that should also be referenced. So this final question uh, we're going to take is from Lizette, who says, as a school nurse, I, I often, oops, so sorry about that. I often use the peak flow meter as an assessment tool. Are you recommending that really we shouldn't be using this assessment tool at this time? What's your thoughts around peak flow, Dr. Freak? No, so it's still a good assessment tool, but I, I think every child needs to have their own, um, especially those with known asthma, uh, same way they need to keep their own um, quick relief MDIs at school or with them, they should have their own peak flow meters as well, because those should definitely not be shared between students for all the reasons we had mentioned before. Great. Well, thank you. Again, Dr. Breek, I, I can't thank you enough for your expertise today and for your participation in this series of COVID-19 webinars. I also want to thank each of you who are listening today. We hope that this information has truly helped you in your daily management of asthma in the home setting, in the work setting, and at school. Our next COVID-19 webinar will be on July 29th at 4 p.m. Eastern, and this is when we'll address back-to-school issues specifically and also discuss Discuss considerations for students with asthma in the era of COVID-19. So thank you again for joining us um, at Allergy and Asthma Network. We are here every day and working diligently to ensure that we all breathe better together. And this is Tanya Winders on behalf of the staff at the network wishing you a wonderful, great, and healthy day. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.